Welcome to the fourth part of the Common Ancestry series. The first part looked at the history of evolutionary thought, the second part took us through tetrapods, new kinds took us through fish, and the third part brought us up to the most recent common ancestor of all bilaterally symmetrical animals, called the Erbilaterian. This video will take us through the remaining animals right up to the most recent common ancestor of all animals, so let's jump right in. When we ended the last video, we pointed out that the Erbilaterian was an acelomate, worm-like animal. Looking at the phylogenetics, we see that acelomate animals, which are bilaterally symmetrical, are only slightly more derived than cnidarians, which are generally radially symmetrical. However, cnidarian larvae, called planula, are bilaterally symmetrical, ciliated, flattened, unsegmented animals. It would appear that such an animal gave rise to the bilaterians according to the planuloid aceloid hypothesis. This hypothesis states that pedamorphosis occurred in a cnidarian-like planula similar to how it occurred in tunicate-like larvae for the vertebrates. For the vertebrates, the retention of offspring traits into adulthood is a specific type of pedamorphosis called neoteny, and for the planula, they would have reached sexual maturity while young, called progenesis. So, a population of planula achieved progenesis, then the next development was that of the digestive tract. Cnidarians have only one digestive opening that functions as the mouth and anus. However, bilaterally symmetrical animals have two openings. Thus, the planula simply developed a split in their opening. The split would have required a few cells originally and could have easily evolved more cells over time. Now, whether or not the bilaterian, anterior, posterior, and dorsoventral axes result from homologous oral aboyal axis cnidarian genes is disputed. Regardless, a large number of bilaterian genes were present prior to the origin of bilaterians. And, side note, the 2015 paper, The Origin of the Animals and a Savannah Hypothesis for Early Bilaterian Evolution, proposes that the contemporary Ediacaran fauna provided the foundation upon which bilaterally symmetrical animals could grow and diversify. We share a common ancestor with Cnidarians that lived about 590 million years ago, and Cnidarians are jellyfish, sea anemones, and corals. Fascinatingly, developmental work done in jellyfish has possibly revealed the origin of eyes as well as linked the evolution of eyes and ears, collectively called mechanoreceptors. The 2004 paper, Cubozoan Jellyfish, an EvoDevo model for eyes and other sensory systems, suggests that a Hox gene called PAX-B was one of the earliest genes in eye evolution, and this was shown by studying the Cubozoan Jellyfish, Tripidalia cystophora. This work focuses on specialized sensory structures that jellyfish have called ropalia, which often have ocelli for sensing light and statoliths for sensing gravity. For cubozoans, however, the ropalia are especially complex, having ocelli that resemble the eyes of cephalopods and vertebrates. Thus, we leave the triploblastic animals. Triploblast refers to the number of layers of tissue that you develop embryonically. Triploblasts have three layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. The ectoderm produces the epidermis and nervous system. The endoderm produces the digestive, respiratory, endocrine, auditory, and urinary systems and the mesoderm forms everything in between. However, animals with only two tissue layers, the ectoderm and endoderm, are called diploblasts. But cnidarians don't have a true mesoderm. Rather, according to the 2005 paper, Evolution of Striated Muscle, Jellyfish and the Origin of Triploblasty, they express homologous genes for a mesoderm in their larval and polyp stages. So, only tenophores and placozoans are considered to be diploblasts. Next, we share a common ancestor with Tenophora, or the comb jellies, that lived around 600 million years ago, and a common ancestor with Placozoa that lived around 620 million years ago. These dates are more tentative than most others discussed in the series because the relationship of Tenophores and Placozoans to the rest of the animal kingdom is currently unclear. 
For tenophores, currently genetic studies have placed them as sister to Nidarians and Bilaterians, and some Cambrian fossils have even been identified as close relatives of the tenophores, such as Stromatoverus. On the other hand, Placozoans are non-parasitic, multicellular animals that are all classified as one species, Trichoplax adherens, despite having much genetic diversity. Their relationship to other animals is currently described by the epitheliozoa hypothesis. This is so named because it focuses on an epithelial tissue, which is tissue that lines blood vessels and organs, molecular structure called the desmosome. Desmosomes are crucial to cell-to-cell -to -cell adhesion, and all animals except sponges have these. Thus, biologists have combined this with genetic research to place the placozoans. Before we get to the sponges, EvoDevo research has provided insight into the ancestor of diploblastic animals. The 2005 paper, Evolution of Striated Muscle, Jellyfish and the Origin of Triploblasty, proposes that the ancestor of placozoans, tenophores, cnidarians, and bilaterians had flagella, adhesive structures, a digestive area, gametogonia, which are stem cells for gametes, and primordial myocytes, which are muscle cells. Then, the digestive area formed a pocket and primordial myocytes are found between the digestive area and the flagellated epithelia, which was the ancestral state to tenophores and cnidarians. And finally, it formed a through gut and anterior posterior polarity with primordial myocytes aligning along the digestive tube, leading to the bilaterians. At last we meet the sponges, classified as the phylum Porifera and we share a common ancestor with them that lived about 650 million years ago. Sponges are the most basal animals, lacking true tissues. However, despite their morphological simplicity, they have a number of genes that have caused researchers to view the most recent common ancestor of all animals, called the Ermetozoan, as more complicated than previously thought, as indicated by the 2007 paper, Mitochondrial Genome of the Homo Scleromorph Oscarella Carmella, reveals unexpected complexity in the common ancestor of sponges and other animals. Another 2007 paper titled Poriferin Paraphyly and its Implications for Precambrian Paleobiology argues that Homo scleromorph sponges are more closely related to other animals than to other sponges. Before I end this video, we're going to cover the last common ancestor of all animals. This animal is called the Ermetozoan because Metazoa is a technical name for the kingdom Animalia. Uncovering what characteristics this animal had has been truly difficult for researchers, but a few traits have been teased out, according to the 2001 paper, Review, How Was Metazoan Threshold Crossed? The Hypothetical Ermetazoan. This paper says, quote, The hypothetical ancestral animal, the Ermetazoa, from which the Metazoan lineage is diverged, may have had the following characteristics. Cell adhesion molecules with intracellular signal transduction pathways, morphogen slash growth factors forming gradients, a functional immune system, and a primordial nerve cell slash receptor system." Close quote. Well, that finishes off the animals. Remember, the first animals we looked at in this series were humans. And here we are now, 650 million years ago, a world where all life resides in the seas. In the next video, we'll plow ahead into the realm of protists, a planet before animals. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.